1973, the beginning. Maybe not the beginning, like not exactly beginning, but like the beginning of this story. Did you notice that everything on your computer system, at least most of everything, have an icon? What's an icon? What's an icon to start with? Why is the word an icon even an icon? And over the years, icons have changed and they've looked differently. They've changed from whatever they are to look more and more and more fine-tuned. So this video is divided into three parts. Part one, part two, part three. Let's pause first, right? There's so much that's happened in history and there's so many things that have changed over time. Like the computer system that we know now is not the same thing that it was back then. For me to explain this story well, for you to grasp the idea behind why you thought of your job existing, you need to understand this beginning part. So back in 1960s, there was a small company called the Halide Photographic Company, Rochester, New York City. Now this company would go on to create the first photocopying machine. This photocopying machine would allow them raise power. They would rule, they would grow to become Xerox, which was formerly the Highlight Photographic Company. They had everything. Uh, according to Business Insider, the Xerox would grow to be the cradle of innovation for everything computer science. They would go on to create the first true PC. Uh, yeah, literally. They were the Google, the Apple, the Microsoft of that time foundation. This is the best of our jobs and the things that we claim to love so much. Fast forward to March 1st, 1973. This PC had everything. Like I'm saying, Xerox had everything. They had internet, they had mouse, they had GUI, they had icons, they had my picture, they had the picture of Zenap's cats. But they lacked one thing. Me. Not me. Um, they, lacked, they lacked good leadership, basically. That would be the one thing that Xerox lacked that was really crucial to their growth. March 1st, 1973, the Xerox auto was made. They were like less than 2,000 ever made, so they were like distributed to only computer labs and universities, military zones, could even have them, like big corporations, right? A few of those computers would find themselves in Stanford University, a lab that was studying artificial intelligence, and they would find themselves in the hands of two men, David K., and Allen, no, 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 I'm mixing the names. Yeah, Allen K and David Canfield Smith. Smith, not Smith. <laughs> David Canfield Smith. They will go on to be the major names, major players, not the whole players, in what we know today as product designers, graphic designers, whatever design you add in front of whatever you are doing. You've caught up with the history now, you know the whole gist, you know, you know how we got here, you know the computer, you know the names to look out for, right? Alan Kane, David Smith. Um, let's move forward to like the vital part of this story. I need to sit on the floor to really explain this part. In 1967, Alan K, Ed, Shedler, they had squares in the computers that they were using, the Xerox Auto at that time, right? Um, boxes all over the screens. That's how they were able to, you know, to use the computer. They had the mouse, everything. It was so rough, was not very easy to use, but it was something. And it was on this very small computer, they created programming language, small talk. Around the same time, David Canfield Smith, right, was going to get his PhD. He had finished studying mathematics. He had grown interest in computer science. Great people or people that have gone to do really amazing stuff always tend to follow your curiosity. If you've not listened to episode 20 of the podcast, you should listen to it. Now, they would go on to follow his curiosity and get a PhD in 1967 in computer science. Now, in Stanford, right, they had, they had like departments and they had like groups within those departments. So they had people that would go on to like learn certain or focus on certain research within the, the 
departments. It was a cross thing. And then and David joined the SEAL team. SEAL. S-A-I-L. SEAL was one of those small departments. was one of those departments within departments that was studying artificial intelligence. Now you think artificial intelligence now is reigning. Since 1967, it has been existing. These people were one of the grandfathers of what we know as artificial intelligence today. They crawled. They were the guys who crawled so some Altman could run. David had a mentality. He believed that a computer would be smarter and he wanted to train a computer that could learn and teach itself how to learn so the computer could just be going in circles and becoming better, right? For context, in Nigeria, that was around the time where our fathers were fighting civil wars. For all you young people, your grandfathers were fighting civil wars, the Africa war, all of that. David was, you know, studying artificial intelligence. This story we see about icons. Please bear with me. Now, David said, and I quote, if a computer could learn, then it could apply that ability to the tax of learning itself and does learn how to learn better. And after a few iterations, it could become an expert learner. Now, let's pause on David's character. Let's move to this guy, Alan. Find a young man, which was a you know research assistant then in the lab in Stanford, he had another different idea. Him and his friends invented the small talk language. Because the small talk was very critical for so many things that helped the Xerox auto work. David's our guy. Note, David's our guy. He's our main guy. These guys will meet and have a discussion and like cheese and talk now. And then David told him about his notion of why computers, they would teach themselves, they would learn, become better learners, that kind of thing. Alan said something to David during one of these discussions. And that statement, that phrase, which I'll quote a bit, would go on to lead to the creation of Pygmalion, the very thing that will allow us to design a computer system. Alan said, I don't want to make smarter computers. I want to make computers that would help people smarter somebody say something interesting like word word apt you know i don't know what that means but like on point man this particular statement would lead to david asking him that hafa i want to write my tss i want it to look good i want it nice and i want you to be my advisor i want to make you be my guy teach me through this thing it was in this place where they were having this discussion both of them the very thing that allows us to design i don't know why i'm whispering but like you know i'm just whispering the very seed to what we have right now. The main, main shit starts to form from this very conversation that they had. The project was called Pike Million and the inspiration was from the books K had given David. So K gave David a couple books to read. You know, David was expressing her, my mentor. You know that kind of thing when you child somebody and said you should be your mentor and then they expect them, they are expecting them to send you design books and they start sending you romance. No romance in this case. K gave David some books and these books were not like anything related to programming, books of arts fashion style like design things that are abstract like creating stuff there were no programming books david would actually read these books this is the end of part two right so if you like the video so far click the like button if you don't click the dislike button twice precisely and this from this inspiration of these books you get the word pike million pike million the birth of the gui and icon graphical user interface <laughs> this is where the seed started coming up from the ground you know when you water something and it's coming up this is when you are toasting that babe and she's beginning to reply. Welcome to part three, the birth of the graphical user interface and the icon. Pygmalion itself, as a word, is the name of a sculptor, right? Now, I think the inspiration I said came from all the books that David's mentor, Alan Kay, had given David to read. David had access to the Xerox Auto. You know, Alan had already created what we know as small talk programming language, which David was using to build. This is very important. This is why this is why I talked about the part one and part two. We talk about the machine, then the people, then now projects are led to the icon itself. So you understand why it's Xerox Auto, you know where it's coming from and how they all would play together. So with his friends, then they would, they would sit down and then be discussing about problems. I don't know why you would sit down and be thinking, they had not, there was no ball to play or I don't know. They sat down and they were thinking about solving random problems with the Xerox Auto. And sometimes they were encounter issues that they could not solve, right? Like they were encounter issues like trying to perform certain actions on the computer, but then it would take a really long time and have so many errors. Now, it, it was a lot. It also is a good thing because it allowed room for innovation and creation because like there was no so many solutions around so you had the opportunity to innovate and create your own solution. So now this, amongst all these problems, right, there was one which the transition distance between the images and the linear the transition code distance was large. The images, so the images the that were added, like pictures that were so added to the computer the and then the code the transition distance was 
I don't know how else to explain this, but like the disaster was too large. And um, he started working on creating executable electronic blackboards. Before then, it was not called an icon. It was, you know, electronic executable blackboard. This is very interesting because this is where the work started, right? Now, he has started working on Pygmalion. Um, and then K was his project supervisor at that point in time. So he had access to the person who created the programming language that he was using to work on Pygmalion. In this process, he started digging deep. I started doing research, looking for, I I keep this laptop, I guess, doing. how do we solve this things? Where do we go to from here? Like, what is the reason behind all of this? As I said initially, right? You have limited resources to documentation and use cases and problems that have been solved because not so many people, but this was the room David needed. Now, David was on a mission to figure out how to take images and allow them function on this Xerox Auto. It took David like a long period of time to figure out all of this. No, when I say David, David Campbell Smith in this case, always going back and forth with him and Kay, always reaching out to Kay, him and his guys will figure out one or two things. He will be bugged to crash. Like basically what we do now when building startups, he would go out, do this, it would crash, come back, try again, it would crash, write this, it would crash, do this. Like so many things were just going off all the time. Towards the end of his project, which was really interesting time, right? David was, it took like two years. Uh, I think he did it like a year. It took him like two years to work on this thing. Around 1973. Now David had developed what we call GUI. Right, over time, the graphical user interface. This was the very first of, of its kind. The icons at this time was not called an icon, it was an executable blackboard, right? Executable electronic blackboard. Executable, execute, electronic executable blackboard. I was thinking of a name. What do I call these things on the screen? Like he had formed this, the project was, the demo was good. It was an MVP, it was really shitty and buggy. But it was working for the most part right and that was good like it was working david initially encountered at that time it was a religious object it was an object a spiritual object that meant two things to the people who were like worshiping and like had connection with it and he thought of this exact object on my screen functions exactly the same way as the religious object i had initially seen and admired let me quote and it's more than an image because it embodies the properties of what it represents. That is the definition of an icon. That's what an icon is. An icon is an object that embodies the properties of what it represents. Now you know, you can pause the video there, subscribe, like, or click the unlike button twice if you do not like this video. Moving forward. Now, after this, it was groundbreaking. He had named it the icon. He had developed the graphical user interface because he kept on thinking, how would other non-technical people use this object? How would they be able to use the Xerox Auto? That was one of his many goals in the project, right? How would non-technical people... And this, is very, this allows me to ask a question, which I'll ask at the end. There was a whole debate about the delete icon. Do you know that the delete icon was a black hole before? Like, it was a black hole and then graphic designers the job david had created the design graphic designers would sit down and argue of whether they should use a, the, the image of a black hole which was one of the most beautiful icons ever created at that time or a trash can which was like a trash like they would debate for hours on which to use so as scientists as geeks as nerds it was easy you know you put it in the black hole it's gone forever and we're like no uh, for normal people this is the best question I'm going to ask. For normal people, they don't know what the black hole is. That's another story. They hired David to work in Xerox. You know, the project was beautiful, it was nice, it was amazing. David was hired to work at Xerox and to complete his work, allowing him to use his research and what he had found to improve the Xerox Auto because they were going to go public. I mentioned earlier that Xerox had somebody come into their lab and they gave... <laughs> They gave this person a tour. Like, they gave this person a well-detailed tour in their whole lab. This person would turn out to be Steve Jobs. Few months after, he would go on to hire the people who were working at Xerox to come work for Apple and create the first Apple Lisa. In 1983, Xerox Auto, first public PC for users, for people, for general public to use, when the Lisa came out. Yeah, that brings me to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, uh, please let me know in the comments. If you found resources or you want resources or however I found all of this, let me know in the comments. Oh yeah, bye. Peace.
times where you're like 2 a.m. in the night and you're trying to sleep, but your brain is not trying to sleep and you just start wondering about shit. That's how we got here. 